Okay, we're going to get going here. I appreciate all of uh, the students in social justice, activism, and Jews volunteering for this required event. Thank you. Um, so welcome everyone to the third event of the USF SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice 2016-17 academic year, where tonight we will have a book launch, talk, and discussion with the author of Judaism's, a 21st century introduction <laughs> to Jews and Jewish identities. Founded in 2008, the USF Jewish Studies and Social Justice program is the first and only program in the history of the United States formally linking Jewish studies with social justice. In addition to offering numerous courses related to this interdisciplinary field, our program offers a minor in JSSJ, as well as a number of events, including an annual speaker series, an annual human rights lecture, an annual social justice lecture, and an annual social justice Passover Seder. This fall's fourth and final event will take place on Tuesday, November 29th, when we will have an on-campus book launch for Torah Told Different, Stories for a Pan-Poly Post-Denominational World, written by poet, writer, teacher, and JSSJ faculty member, Andrew Raymer. <laughs> Stealing my uh, applause. Flyers regarding this semester's final event can be found on the table near the front door. Um, and if you're interested in being put on our listserv, there's also a sign up there. Special thanks for co-sponsoring tonight's event goes to the Department of Theology and Religious Studies, of which I just happen to be chair at the moment. <laughs> All right, normally at this point in the JSSJ event introduction, I segue into the official beginning to the program. It usually starts somewhere along the following lines. Many of the most pressing issues of the 21st century are those human beings have been grappling with for centuries. Ideas such as right and wrong, justice and injustice, and responsibility. After that, I bring up Adam and Eve, make some theoretical connection between these biblical characters, connecting them to renowned 20th century activists like Bella Abzug, Emma Goldman, Lillian Wald. Then I mention how these social justice issues continue to play a central role in many of our lives today, from places like San Francisco to Damascus, New York City to Cairo, Ferguson to Flint. At this point in the official introduction, I then give a small vignette about a social justice activist. Sometimes I'm in the mood for giving a quote about an important thinker. Then I pivot to saying something like how tonight's speaker lives his or their life in the tension between particularism and universalism. But tonight is different. Though this is my 10th year on campus, this is the first time I've put on a JSSJ event spotlighting me or my scholarship. Though to some degree it makes me uncomfortable to do this, at the end of the day I believe in the potential merit of the book I will speak about tonight. And for this, if nothing else, I think it's okay to create a space for me to talk about this book, Judaism's a 21st Century Introduction to Jews and Jewish Identities, and though problematic and uh, a little less nice, forcing students to show up. <laughs> Published this past summer, in fact, Judaism's is more than a book to me, though I take scholarship seriously. Because I'm Jewish, I'm an individual who identifies as part of the Jewish communities because I teach courses about Jews, about Judaisms, about the connection between Jews and Judaisms to social justice, because I have two little kids that my partner and I are raising as Jews, the ideas embedded in this book are of utmost importance to me, more so than anything else I've ever written. With that in mind, tonight I'd like to do three things. First, I'd like to share with you just a small number of the reasons why I felt it important to write this book. Second, I'd like to read a few selections from the book in an effort to illustrate how what I hope this book can offer is something new, something that hasn't been said before, or at least offer a new presentation that, of things that have been said before. And third, I'd like to have a Q&A with all of you to create some sort of space for discussion. So first, why Judaism was important to write. So when I got the job at USF in 2007, the first course I was slated to teach for fall 2007, unsurprisingly, was called Introduction to Judaism. 
So for the first time in my life, though I taught many courses informally and formally on university campuses to high school students, uh, a range of, range of subjects, I had to think to myself for the first time, so how am I gonna do this? Um, I've taught many you know, classes, not, lecture, not a 16 week semester, I've taught one-off classes, maybe three-part classes about Judaism, but I have this opportunity now of 16 weeks, and whatever the students come away with, assuming you know, they retain the knowledge and all of that, this, this is how they're gonna understand the Jewish people to some degree. Now, because I identify with that group, that's kind of hard to do for anybody, teaching any course where it's, you're teaching about a community with which you identify. So I really was starting from scratch. I looked at syllabi, um, lots of syllabi, and it took me a number of years to come to the conclusion that there wasn't a book out there that, that worked for me, that I felt worked for the students at USF. Um, and though I can still remember uh, almost 20 years ago being in a, a Jewish communal setting laughing with, with a friend of mine at the time of Just What the World Needs, another intro to Judaism book. We were in the library of this pseudo-synagogue and there were all these intro to, intro to Judaism books. And I remember as a cocky 25-year-old laughing and being like, why did they think that they had to write another book? Like, we need one more? And you know, lo and behold, I wrote one too. Um, but despite the fact that there's many excellent books out there, it was the way in which they were framed that really didn't speak to me. So there's four ways that I wanted a book out there that now is, is the core book for the course, Jews, Judaism, and Jewish Identities. It's a book we pull chapters from for a, a number of other Jewish studies courses at USF. I wanted there to be four things that I didn't find in other books. Um, and on top of that, I'll get to those four things in one sec, I wanted also to create a book that could be used by teachers. So I, you know, it has, the book has key terms and key ideas and it actually has an activity section online where if somebody's teaching about this for the first time or even if they've, they've uh, they, they've taught Intro to Judaism courses before, it gives them an opportunity for interactive activities. They don't have to make them up themselves. All right. Um, it's a good song. <laughs> All right, so there was four things that I wanted that I really didn't see in these other books. One was approaching Jews as a social identity. You want it? Just a little bit. It's a problem we professors on campus, you know, we have classes next to it. It's not uncommon. Okay. So I wanted a book that approached the Jewish identity from a place of social identities. You know, the common way of understanding Jews is, oh, that's a religion. And there's a lot of tangible historical reasons for that, including specifically in the American milieu, Christianity is understood as a religion, so then Judaism is understood in relationship to Christianity, right? If the norm is Christianity in terms of this identity, then so Jews are understood as a religion from that vantage point. But more to the point, Jews, especially Jews of younger generations, under 40, don't identify necessarily, roughly one in, uh, one in three Jews under the age of 40 does not identify as a Jew in terms, of their eth in terms of their religion. Instead, they identify as a Jew in terms of their ethnicity or heritage or culture. And in fact, many of those Jews specifically say they don't have a religion. So uh, the academics might call it the nuns, N-O-N-E, the nuns. They don't have a religion, but they do identify as Jewish. So how does that work? Oh, because Judaism is your ethnicity, is your culture. So most of these books didn't have that frame, which most of the students I teach are not Jewish, but even the ones I do teach are of that younger generation. And many of them, not all by no means, but many of them orient to their Jewish identity through that lens. Judaism being a culture, a race, an ethnicity, uh, a nation, a nationality, etc. 
Second thing I wanted to focus on was Jews in relationship to non-Jews. Not only because I was teaching or am teaching now to non-Jews by and large, but it's incredibly important for people to have a framework right from the get-go that, you know, Jews, there's not many of them compared to the seven and a half billion or so humans on this planet, there's not that many Jews. 0.2%, right? And there's studies out there of if you ask people how many Jews, what percentage of the world do you think is Jewish, especially in Europe and the United States of America, people have incredibly exaggerated understandings of how many Jews there are, but in the States there's roughly 2%. Um, but it was important for me to put that in context right from the get-go. Um, third thing, I wanted to focus on the diversity of Jews. And the last thing was I wanted there to be an internal critique, some sort of sense of self-awareness. So in terms of the first one of those, social identities, um, what I tried to do in the book is focus on, well not necessarily focus, but start each chapter, so there's 12 chapters plus an intro, um, right from my own narrative at the beginning of the chapter. Now despite the fact that it's a very subjective thing, despite the fact that I have multiple privileged identities, male, heterosexual, white, 6'5", etc., etc., American, um, you know, I am who I am. That's my entry point into this conversation and I did it as an attempt to really focus on two things. One is that anyone reading the book is coming at it from their own identity, and to try to remind people of that. But the second thing being that um, Judaism doesn't exist outside of people, right? It, it's, an, it's an active religion, like Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, et cetera, et cetera. But my approach to um, what it means to be Jewish is that all of us perform our social identities. We perform our race, we perform our ethnicity, we perform our gender, our sexual orientation, that how I dress, how I talk, everything. Obviously there's spectrums within each of those social categories, but I really want to make a, an overt connection between these things I'm writing about and the way actual Jews live. That there's, you know, there's texts and there's doctrine, but there's people. And that the Jewish people, like all groups that I'm aware of, it, these are identities that are performed. So I just wanted to read a couple vignettes to give you a sense of what, I was talk what I'm talking about in terms of social identities. This is, uh, I mentioned to somebody, is a, is a biased uh, podium. All right, so here's one. Um, it's in a chapter called Laws. And uh, the setting is, are you sure you're Jewish? About six weeks into my summer studies at an Orthodox yeshiva seminary in the old city of Jerusalem, I was asked to go to the office of the school's Mara Da'atra, the individual who made decisions regarding Jewish law, halakha. As he was revered in the seminary, I was nervous. Because I had no idea why I was being summoned, I was also curious. I knocked on the office door and heard a gentle voice say, the door's open, come in. Bearded and clothed in his community's semi-official uniform, a black sport coat and pants, a white button-down dress shirt, and a pointy black kippah, a head covering, that sat on his head like a pyramid, the rabbi waved his arm in the direction of an empty chair. As soon as I sat down, he said, I noticed on your seminary application to study at our school that your father was born Jewish, but your mother converted. You wrote down that her conversion was completed prior to your being born, and that it was conducted under the auspices of the conservative movement. Did I get that right? Yes, I politely answered. Well, he softly responded, it seems that you may not be Jewish. Conversions performed by conservative rabbis are sometimes kosher, sometimes halakhically valid, and sometimes not. And what I believe was an attempt to diffuse any tension, he smiled and said, Lucky for you, it wasn't performed by the reform. It wasn't funny. He went on to explain that for the time being, I could continue my studies at the yeshiva with the caveat that I was to conduct research into the conversion alongside his own. 
When was the conversion done? Where was it done? Was the ritual bath my mother used kosher? Who were the witnesses? Were they kosher? Were they men? And so forth. He told me that the stakes were very high. Existentially speaking, he said, whether or not my mother's conversion was kosher would determine whether or not I had a Jewish soul. As I left his office, my initial reaction was a mix of confusion and resentment. That's a soft way of saying it. I was 21 also, for those of you 21 out there. Questions flew through my head like a CNN news ticker on overdrive. How could my mom not be Jewish? Could her Jewish identity be nullified on a technicality? And what about me? How could the amount of water in my mom's ritual bath some 30 years ago, years before I was even born, change my identity? Didn't it matter that I went to a Jewish parochial school for 13 years? Was it beside the point that I spent 10 summers at a religious summer overnight camp affiliated with the conservative movement? Where we prayed every day, observed the Jewish Sabbath, kept kosher, as well as many other rituals? What about my bar mitzvah? Regularly attending synagogue on Shabbat and other Jewish holidays, my numerous trips to the Holy Land, my active involvement in my university campus's Jewish student center. That night, while going over the day's events, I realized something obvious yet profound. My problem wasn't with the rabbi whatsoever. In fact, any negative feelings I had projected onto him had dissipated. My issue was with halakha the system of Jewish law. Yes, of course, the rabbi had a stricter interpretation of Jewish law than many, including many other Orthodox rabbis, but ultimately the question of whether or not my Jewish identity could be turned on its head was not something he invented. The parameters regarding the ritual bath in which my mom had submerged some three decades prior were based in a system of law that dated back centuries. The next day I visited the home of my own rabbi, more liberal than those at the yeshiva, yet nonetheless wedded to Jewish law. He agreed with the premise of what I had been told. There are precise rituals that one must complete in order to become a Jew. As we were both Americans, he made the analogy to becoming a citizen of the United States, contending that during the naturalization process, one must pass a set of tests, which among other things, demonstrate a knowledge and understanding of the history and principles and form of government of the United States. If successful, after a formal interview, one then takes an oath of allegiance at a naturalization ceremony, a ritual that officially means one has become a United States citizen. My rabbi, who considered halakha to be oblig obligatory, pointed out that all legal systems have rules, especially those governing who can and cannot join a community. At the time, I disagreed responding that one's Jewish identity is much different than citizenship. Identity is internal as much as external, I remember saying. My Judaism, my Jewishness, is my religion as much as it's my culture, ethnicity, or something else. It's not the same thing as having rights as a citizen of a country. One can take on an identity without having to take a test. Putting our immediate discussion to the side, my rabbi walked over to a bookcase in his library where he quickly located a number of Chuvot, halakhic responses, or um, responses of Jewish law to particular questions on the issue at hand, all written by orthodox and conservative legal experts. Over the next few weeks, after making a few phone calls regarding the ritual bath my mom had used in her conversion, and applying this information to these ritual, these um, legal responses, the specifics of my mom's conversion were clarified. It had been kosher which meant that my Jewishness, my identity, wasn't in doubt. Nonetheless, the experience left me with deep questions regarding social identities and the seeming ease with which some can become undone. So each chapter starts with a vignette, not, not necessarily as, um, as uh, dramatic as that, um, but in an effort for me to, in a sense, what I'm asking people to do when they read those books is to engage with their own identity in as much as they're learning about these Jewish identities, whether or not they identify as Jewish themselves. And what I was trying to do, and who knows if I succeeded for some students, um, is to mirror that exact request by putting that information out there about myself. Um, so some of the chapters deal with things along those lines, some of them are a, a bit more uh, benign in their anecdotalness. Um, 
But that was one of the things, one of the four main things that I noticed that other books didn't have in terms of social identities. They didn't, they didn't approach Judaism through the lens of social identities. The second thing, as I already mentioned, is in relationship to uh, non-Jews. The third thing was really diversity. And this bumps up against the fourth thing, which is self-critique. Um, so I'll actually kind of mix them both together. So what I didn't find in many books was a description of the Jewish people as an incredibly diverse group. I found many of the books connecting the dots in a very simplistic way. Um, and there's nothing simple about a group that ostensibly, according to their dominant narrative, goes back 4,000 years, 3,000 by some count, whatever the case, that, you know, that whether or not there's any historical accurateness to that is pretty much up in the air. Uh, a lot of these books presented things, historical accuracy, as if these ambiguities happened, for sure. And, you know, we're not entirely sure what happened yesterday, let alone 4,000 years ago. So presenting things as historical fact when the really historical ambiguity was one piece of the self-critique. But the other was teaching things in, um, through the lens of dominant identities and dominant voices, and that there wasn't a mechanism in these books to engage in that conversation. So for the 20 or so of you that volunteered for this required event from social justice, activism, and Jews, you know, one of the things we looked at early was the difference between social justice and social diversity, right? Diversity is focusing on how everyone's different, right, and embracing that. But social justice looks not only at the difference across social identities, but it also looks at power, you know, it looks at marginalization, it looks at dominance. And it's one thing to um, praise, as we should, the diversity and the distinctness between all of us. But it's quite another thing to then focus on, and here's some stories that are being told, and there's here's some that are not being told, and to really bring that to the fore. She's not leaving for any other reason than she has another event. So the way in which I had to do that was pretty difficult. Meaning, how do you offer a self-critique without somebody who's reading the book who identifies as Jewish responding in a defensive way, right? So, you know, aside from trying to find images that I thought were funny, um, particularly Sarah Silverman. How many of you know who the, uh, the gentleman is with the microphone? All right, so it is very generational. Okay. Um, that's what I was told in, in the people who read the book and give you feedback early on. Um, so part of the way I, I tried to do that was through imagery. And through that process, try to challenge some of the, the archetypes, some of the, the images we have in our heads as, oh, that's what it means to be Jewish. Right? If you type Jew into Google, you're going to get a lot of similar looking people, which are more or less looking like caricatures, which is a whole different thing. So how do you present a self-critique and at the same time focus on diversity? So one way was to, to just to ask questions. Like really, is there a common bond? I mean, if we go back, is there a common bond between these four people, right? Albert Einstein, Gene Simmons. How many people know who Gene Simmons is? Oh, all right, wow. Kiss fans or just, oh, is, uh, is reality TV show? Yeah, okay. Um, Sarah Silverman and uh, Sammy Davis Jr. It's, it's one thing to ask, all right, what do any of these people have in common? It's a fair question. Well, they all identify with this signifier Jew. And you can do that same thing, of course, with all sorts of groups. You can say, is there really a common cultural or ethnic bond between Brazilian and Amazonian Jews and Uzbekistani Jews? What about an Alaskan Ashkenazi Jew, Ugandan or Bayudaya Jew, and it doesn't matter if you know what these things are. All that matters is these are people from very disparate parts of the world 
who claim the same signifier, but they speak different languages. They have incredibly distinct cultures. A Syrian Aleppo-identified Jew, a Peruvian Incan Jew. So that's kind of easy to point that out. And, and you know, you can point out, ah, okay, so here's a family of Jews in China, in Kaifeng, in Kaifeng. And you can, you can put in a book, like no one's gonna really have problems with, oh, okay, here's pictures, uh, and these are other Jews, other ways of being a Jew. Or this is a family from India, uh, recently arrived in Israel, and here's some Indian Jews. Or here's some Iraqi Jews. Or some more Iraqi, famous Iraqi rabbi. Some Uzbekistani Jews. Yemenite Jews. Some different Yemenite Jews and a Yemenite bride. So that's one way to do it. Another way is to push the envelope in terms of it's not just distinctions vis-a-vis -vis race and ethnicity and culture, but it's also distinctions in terms of gender and sexual orientation and sex. So here's a picture, this, you know, the book came out just a few months ago, and this picture is only from last year. Um, but this is a gender transition ceremony, right? So that was another idea I had of how do you integrate, how do you mainstream marginalized identities, right? So if you wanted there to be imagery of someone who identifies as transgender, or gay, or lesbian, or bisexual, or what have you, well, one of these many marginalized identities vis-a-vis -vis gender, sex, sexual orientation, well, there were quite a few images I went through, and then it dawned on me, maybe you want to do a quote-unquote normal picture, right, which challenges the whole idea of what the norm is, but this is a gender transition ceremony, uh, a Jewish K-8 through school in the East Bay, um, and happens to be a Moroccan female rabbi. I mean, there's actually a lot of layers to this photo, but Tom Sosnick uh, lived much of his life, uh, his gender expression was female, and it was important to me to try to bring some of those images into the book. So these are more in terms of race and ethnicity. This is a uh, interesting subgroup of Ethiopian Jews who for years um, externally their expression was Christian. Uh, they live in a Christian dominant country and they literally put tattoos of crosses on their faces so they wouldn't be persecuted as Jews so they pretended to be Christian externally but internally in their homes and their identity uh, was Jewish. Um, this is a little uh, Arab Jewish boy from Tunisia. Um, some, some women in Jerusalem. Uh, a group of Jews um, from all over the country, but they did this actually also right near here in San Francisco. So one way is putting images out there. All right? And who's part of the conversation? Whose stories are you leaving out? And the nice way of presenting this is saying that we have this in, inattentional blindness is the very benign word I chose to use, right? But basically we're talking about bias, prejudice, discrimination. But how do you, how do you mainstream marginalized ideas was another challenge. I'm not saying I succeeded in any of these things, but these were things I thought quite a bit about before I came out with the book. Inattentional blindness is a term some social psychologists use. Um, in, in my class, that I showed you the invisible gorilla experiment, and, and many people know about it. That's the term they use, where there's something right in front of you and you don't see it. And it's there, but you don't see it. So you could call that bias. You could call that blindness. You could call that, you know, not with the gorilla, but you could call it racism or sexism or all sorts of isms. But really, well, inattentional blindness is the softest way possible I could come up with of saying bias, prejudice, discrimination, which I more or less didn't use those terms. So here's another way I t attempted to do this. So I, part of the book presents how over the last century Jews have gone through some major shifts, seismic shifts, if you will, in terms of their identities. One of the primary ways is that 80% of today's Jews live 
in only two countries, United States of America and the State of Israel. So 100 years ago, you didn't have a State of Israel. And roughly 120 years ago, you didn't have the number of Jews that you do have today. Between 1880 and 1910, roughly a million Jews immigrated to the United States. So though there's roughly 200 countries in the planet, and Jews are present at the moment on about 175 of them, so even though they're 0.2% of the world, they're still incredibly dispersed. 80% of all Jews live in two places. So you can point that out and then circle back to it and say, okay, so there's an American-centric and an Israel-centric lens to it. And most people aren't, don't have a problem with that because these are just facts on the ground. Another is to point out how women are in roles of authority as never seen before. So the fact that you can have female rabbis, right? When the fact that you still have to say female in front of rabbi points to the fact that female rabbis aren't as normative yet. But um, that's, an, that's a 20th century development. Uh, you've had Jewish leaders, really um, outliers over history, who have been women, but as a mainstream form of leadership, it's an incredibly contemporary idea. So most Jews, when presented with that, they're like, yeah, of course, we get that. Um, but then that enters the conversation to um, male domination and how women are marginalized and women are still unequal. Same thing with domin non-dominant identities in terms of gender, sex, sexual orientation. Right, so you point these things out, you say some identities within the Jewish collective are dominant, others are subordinate, American-centric, Israel-centric, male-centric, heteronormative, and then you can also have this conversation about how it's Ashkenazi-centric. Now, Ashkenaz is, um, people who identify as Ashkenazi by and large trace their Jewish heritage back to Eastern Europe, Russia, that part of the world. But in the United States of America, the way that thing race has developed in this country is such that Ashkenazi is code for white in, in no uncertain terms. That Jews, like many uh, immigrant populations, have become white over the 20th century. But Ashkenazi means white. So then you can have a conversation that doesn't get people on the defensive and say, well, it's inattentional blindness instead of saying it's racism, right? You talk about these dominant groups. So the dominant Jewish story is Ashkenazi. The dominant Jewish story is white, which marginalizes non-whites. And then you can make, make the connections between, ah, okay, so then you have a similar um, problem in the United States of America in terms of whiteness and non-whiteness and people being defined by what they are not instead of by what they are, right? People of color and those types of ideas. So that's more or less what I tried to do with this book. Um, and, you know, it's uh, definitely still too early to know if it'll have any effect in, in moving conversations along, in particular, in my opinion, in the Jewish community is, is most important to me because that's the intention of a self-critique. Um, but that's, that's, those are many of the ideas that were going through my head when, when I was trying to figure out how to organize all of these things, because as I say in the uh, preface to the book, to some degree, this book is, you know, an accumulation of things I've been taught over the course of 40 plus years, um, of living the life uh, of someone who identifies as a Jew. So what I want to do now for another 15, 20 minutes is if anyone has questions uh, about anything whatsoever related to the book, um, we've got a microphone in the middle there, and uh, feel free. Hi. Uh, yeah, I think you got to turn it on first. And you can take it out of the thing. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Um, my question to you, is mentioned at the beginning of your lecture that you had taught before, but you had never actually taught a class about Judaism, except for like small segments. So what was it 
that drew you to teach Judaism as actively as you do now? Um, well, to some degree, that was the job I was hired to do here. Uh, there was, in the late 70s, a Jewish studies program was started here, the first at a Catholic school, Jesuit or otherwise, in planet Earth. Uh, it was founded in 1977. Um, so I was four years old at the time. So that makes me 43. So I'm the third person to have the position. So that was, that was part of my mandate, was to teach courses related to Jewish studies. Um, but I had to figure out a way that it would be pieces of Jewish identities, pieces of Jewish identities that spoke to me. Um, I don't know why to fade it, but that worked for me, and um, there would be things I'm interested in teaching about, that I'm passionate about teaching. Um, so I had to figure out some of these linkages, like our course, Social Justice Activism and Jews. I had to figure out. I didn't want it, the standard way that course might be taught if, if you want to gather syllabi it would be the historical relationship between Jews one, when they were a marginalized group, I mean they still are in some capacities, but by and large they're, they're not to the same degree they were 100 years ago, and it's usually taught historically, um, but I wanted to make it more relevant to students, um, that my goal wasn't to exoticize the Jewish people, but to, this is another social group that's out there, and you're in this class, whether to fulfill a core requirement or whatever, but you're here, I got you for 16 weeks, and to uh, connect these different pieces of the puzzle in a way that worked for me, and I felt was honest, um, and also touching on what I was hoping to touch on in terms of the course content. Doesn't work. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi. Um, so my question is: Is in my Jewish Judaism and Jewish Ethics class, you have to watch? I'm not sure if that is. No, I, I think uh, I think it's taking turns. <laughs> so you talk. Um, we have to watch a film called Diaspora by Frederick Brenner. And he, he notes in the, in the film that well, he shows, I'm sure everyone, everyone here has probably watched it, but he shows um, Jews from all over the world, of all races, ethnicities, different countries, and all those things through photographs, and he narrates it. Um, and one of the things he says is the only thing that seems to connect um, all these people is the fact that they call themselves Jewish um, because the cultures are so distinct. And I was wondering, with that story that you had at the beginning of the chapter, Laws, um, with that rabbi, what, would, what do you think he would think of Ethiopian Jews and Peruvian Jews and things like that? And what would he think of their authenticity? And how would he judge whether or not they were Jewish, or whether or not um, if some had converted, um, if their rituals, if different from Ashkenazi Jews um, in Israel, I think it was in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. if their rituals were different, would he judge them differently, their authenticity as being Jews? If that makes sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Microphone's still not working. Makes a lot of sense. Um, you have to some degree Frederick Brenner's approach that the only thing in common between these different people is that they all use the same signifier. They all use the same word, this identity marker, Jew. Um, um, and that's a very postmodern approach, right? I mean, it, it's the time in which we live where things have been deconstructed to a place where that is. One of the dominant ways, especially uh, in, in people who have had opportunities for higher education, have been taught that, oh, identity, it's all a social construct. Right? We talk about in class and how much of it is a construct, how much of it is real, how much of it is real because we don't 
live our lives as if it's just a construct. We live our lives as if it's a total social fact. Um, you know, that rabbi, he lives in an ultra-Orthodox world, and he orients to the entire world through the lens of Jewish law, and a very, very strict understanding of Jewish law. So for him, it would be a simple question. You're Jewish if you were born to a Jewish mother, or you converted according to what he would have, what he would consider to be orthodox enough standards. So he would, he would orient toward that question in a, in a way related to Jewish law, but a very ultra-orthodox perspective on Jewish law. Um, I mean, you have an interesting thing with many of groups that have immigrated to the state of Israel in the last 60 plus years of whether or not the chief rabbis who are, there's two chief rabbis. One identifies as Ashkenazi, one identifies as Sephardi. Right? So even the state of Israel upholds this binary that we've talked about in the class of Ashkenazi or Sephardi when actually there's Indian Jews and Mizrahi Jews and Chinese Jews and Ethiopian Jews, that none of those fit into the boxes of Ashkenazi and Sephardi. So the Ashkenazi and Sephardi chief rabbis, historically over the last six years, have decided whether or not the Ethiopian Jews are really Jewish when they wanted to move to the state of Israel in mass in the 80s and 90s. Or, oh, we discovered these Jews in India, and now we need to decide are they really Jews or not. And that's when you get into the power, right? Of who's making that decision? Who's to say that you're in or you're out? Um, but from an ultra-Orthodox perspective, it's as simple as you're Jewish if your mother's Jewish, or you converted according to ultra-Orthodox standards. Despite the fact that historically, going if you take the Bible as some sort of historical document, um, you're Jewish if you're born to a Jewish father. Actually, there's no Jewish. You're a Hebrew or you're an Israelite if you're born to someone who is Israelite or someone who is a Hebrew. But it's your father, not your mother. We have no idea historically when the exact shift happened. We don't even know where the term Jew necessarily came from linguistically. People think it might have come from the tribe of Judah. Um, but we don't know. So. Someone who's ultra-Orthodox isn't looking at it through that lens. 99.9999% of ultra-Orthodox Jews don't think of it in terms of, well, technically we don't know when it went from patrilineal, defining a Jew based on born to a father, to matrilineal, born to based on your mother's identity. Um, so it's, the question is much easier answered, I would say. And it's not something to struggle with and to think about a lot. Because it's, oh, it's black and white. You're in or you're out based on this parameter. But most Jews are not ultra-Orthodox. And most Jews don't live in that space of, um, I would say, simplicity in terms of their Jewish identity. That's, that's just not the Biyat Politik of the Jewish people. Maybe one more question. Yes. Okay. I don't know if you want the mic, but it's I can't, not working. I can't offer you one. Yeah. So, to what degree did being at USF change or influence how you wrote this book? Um, I think to a major degree. I mean, before 2007, so Professor Hidiyat Dalla and I have known each other for almost 15 years now. We, we did our PhDs together. So, back in 2002, I in these one-off or what have you, I had done, taught about Jews, primarily to non-Jews in conflict resolution, interfaith, conflict transformation settings. So I already had some experience of teaching about this identity to people who don't identify it as such. Right? Teaching Jews about Jews is different than teaching Jews, uh, teaching non-Jews about Jews. But it's also different in a 45 minute class versus a 16 week semester. Um, I knew coming in, I knew the statistics of the number of students who identified as Jewish. Um, and I knew that most of the students who would probably end up in my classes were not Jewish. So I, it was huge to think to myself, not only, I mean, I didn't necessarily know as much about the Jesuits or the Catholic community um, to the extent that I do after 10 years, but 
I knew that most of my students would not be Jews, and I, I thought that many more of them would be self-identified Catholics. So I would have to enter from that lens. Um, but the book is in many ways a product of me teaching this course. I taught, I mean now it's taught by Professor Raymer and Professor Carl Zeldin um, and, and a few others over the years. But Jews, Judaism, Jewish Identities is what I taught. I think I taught it 11 times before um, in, in around 9, 10, I started to, these things started to solidify into a book. But I was taking pieces from this book or this article or this article because the way in which I was interacting with USF students, I was gaining an understanding of how our students, which I don't know how much they're like students at other universities because I haven't taught at those schools, but how our students were kind of organizing their thoughts. And when they, you know, that's why we have, and in San Francisco, so a huge piece of the course is to go out to synagogues and kind of observe. I mean, it's, we would call it in haughty -taughty academics, ethnography or something. But, you know, we're not training ethnographers, so they just, they go out to synagogues, but a piece, or Jewish community centers, or what have you, but a huge piece of the course, because it's been in San Francisco, has also been to get out in the, off campus and see how Jews do their Jewish identity and how that works. Um, so, not only because it's a non-Jewish university, but also specifically because it's been San Francisco, I think has had a huge shape. And if, if one reads the book, they see the imprint of San Francisco all over the place. Um, not just through a couple of the images here and there, but um, even the approach, it's much more a, a Californian Jewish approach to Jews. And, you know, I don't know to what degree that affected me. But, um, you know, if you didn't know I'm from the East Coast, that's why I can be rude sometimes. Um, but I think all of those things played a huge role in shaping it. All right, thank you all for listening and sticking around.